Dean Arnold Corll was an American serial killer who, with two young accomplices named David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley, Jr., abducted, raped, tortured, and murdered at least 28 boys in a series of killings spanning from 1970 to 1973 in Houston, Texas. The crimes, which became known as the Houston Mass Murders, came to light after Henley fatally shot Coral. Coral's victims were typically lured to a succession of addresses in which he resided between 1970 and 1973 with an offer of a party or a lift. They would then be restrained by either force or deception, and all were killed by either strangulation or shooting with a 22 caliber pistol. Coral and his accomplices buried 17 of their victims in a rented boat shed. Four other victims were buried in woodland near Lake Sam Rayburn. One further victim was buried on a beach in Jefferson County. And at least six victims were buried on a beach on the Bolivar Peninsula. Corla was also known as the Candy Man and the Pied Piper, because he and his family had owned and operated a candy factory in Houston Heights, and he had been known to give free candy to local children. At the time of their discovery, the Houston mass murders were considered the worst example of serial murder in American history. Early Life Childhood Dean Arnold Corll was born on December 24, 1939, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the first child of Mary Robinson and Arnold Edwin Corll. Mary Corll subsequently sold the family home and relocated to a trailer home in Memphis, Tennessee where Arnold Corll had been drafted into the Air Force after the couple had divorced, in order that her sons could retain contact with their father. Corll's parents subsequently attempted reconciliation. Corll was a shy, serious child who seldom socialized with other children, but who at the same time displayed concern for the well-being of others. At the age of seven, he suffered an undiagnosed case of rheumatic fever which was only noted in 1950, when doctors found Corll had a heart murmur. As a result of this diagnosis, Corll was ordered to avoid P.E. at school. In 1950, Corll's parents remarried and moved to Pasadena, Texas. However, the reconciliation was short-lived and, in 1953, the couple once again divorced with the mother again retaining custody of her two sons. Their divorce was decreed on amicable grounds and both boys maintained regular contact with their father. Following the second divorce, Coral's mother married a traveling clock salesman named Jake West and the family moved to the small town of Vidor, where Coral's half-sister, Joyce, was born in 1955. He and his younger brother were delegated the responsibility of running the candy-making machines and packing the product, which his stepfather sold on his sales route. This route often involved West traveling to Houston, where much of the product was sold. From 1954 to 1958, Corl attended Vidor High School, where he was regarded as a well-behaved student who achieved satisfactory grades as had been the case in his childhood. Corl was also considered somewhat of a loner, although he is known to have occasionally dated girls in his teenage years. Move to Houston Heights Corl graduated from Vidor High School in the summer of 1958. In a logistical move shortly thereafter, he and his family moved to the northern outskirts of Houston so that the family candy business could be closer to the city where the majority of their product was sold. Coral's family opened a new shop, which they named Pecan Prince. Coral's mother divorced Jake West in 1963 and opened a new candy business, which she named Coral Candy Company. Dean was appointed as vice president of the new family firm. In response, Mary West simply fired the youth. U.S. Army Service Corl was drafted into the United States Army on August 10, 1964. Reportedly, 
Coral divulged to some of his close acquaintances after his release from the United States Army, that it was during his period of service that he had first realized that he was homosexual, and had experienced his first homosexual encounters. Other acquaintances noted subtle changes in Coral's mannerisms when in the company of teenage males after he had completed his service in the Army and returned to Houston, which led them to believe he may have possessed homosexual tendencies. Coral Candy Company Following his honorable discharge from the Army, Coral returned to Houston Heights and resumed the position he had held as vice president of his family's candy business. Coral's former stepfather had retained ownership of the family's former candy business following his mother's divorce in 1963, and competition between the two firms was fierce. As had been the case in his teenage years, Coral increased the number of hours he devoted to the candy business to satisfy an increasing demand for his family's product. In 1965, friendship with David Brooks. In 1967, Coral befriended 12-year-old David Owen Brooks. Brooks' parents were divorced. His father lived in Houston and his mother had relocated to Beaumont, a city 85 miles east of Houston. In 1970, when he was 15, Brooks dropped out of Waltrip High School. By the time Brooks dropped out of high school, Coral's mother and half-sister, Joyce, had moved to Colorado after the failure of her third marriage and the closure of the Family Candy Company in June 1968. Although she often talked to her eldest son on the telephone, his mother never saw him again. 3,647 Following the closure of the Candy Company, Coral took a job as an electrician at the Houston Lighting and Power Company, where he tested electrical relay systems. He worked in this employment until the day he was killed by Elmer Wayne Henley. Murders Between 1970 and 1973, Coral is known to have killed a minimum of 28 victims. All of his victims were males aged 13 to 20, the majority of whom were in their mid-teens. Most victims were abducted from Houston Heights, which was then a low-income neighborhood northwest of downtown Houston. With most abductions, he was assisted by one or both of his teenaged accomplices, Elmer Wayne Henley, and David Owen Brooks. Several victims were friends of either or both of Coral's accomplices. Others were individuals with whom Coral had himself become acquainted prior to their abduction and murder. Coral's victims were usually lured into one of two vehicles he owned, a Ford Econo Line van or a Plymouth GETX. In several instances, Coral forced his victims to either phone or write to their parents with explanations for their absences in an effort to allay the parents' fears for their son's safety. During the years in which he abducted and murdered young men, Coral often changed addresses. First Known Murder Coral killed his first known victim, an 18-year-old college freshman, Jeffrey Conan. On September 25, 1970, Conan vanished while hitchhiking with another student from the University of Texas to his parents' home in Houston. He was dropped off alone at the corner of Westheimer Road and South Foss Road near the uptown area of Houston. At the time of Conan's disappearance, Cora lived in an apartment on Yorktown Street, near the intersection with Westheimer Road. Cora likely offered to drive Conan to his parents' home. Conan evidently accepted. David Brooks led police to the body of Jeffrey Conan on August 10, 1973. The body was buried at High Island Beach. Forensic scientists subsequently deduced that the youth had died of asphyxiation caused by manual strangulation and a cloth gag that had been placed in his mouth. The body was buried beneath a large boulder. 25. Around the time of Conan's murder, David Brooks interrupted Coral in the act of assaulting two teenage boys whom Coral had strapped to a plywood torture board. On December 13, 1970, 
David Brooks lured two 14-year-old Spring Branch youth named James Glass and Danny Yates away from a religious rally held in the Heights District of Houston to Coral's Yorktown apartment. Six weeks after the double murder of Glass and Yates, on January 30, 1971, Brooks and Coral encountered two teenage brothers named Donald and Jerry Waldrop walking toward their parents' home. The other two victims, 13-year-old David Hillegius and 16-year-old Gregory Malley Winkle, were abducted and killed together on the afternoon of May 29, 1971, as had been the case with parents of other victims of Coral. Both sets of parents launched a frantic search for their sons. One of the youths who voluntarily offered to distribute posters the parents had printed offering a reward for information leading to the boys' whereabouts was 15-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley, a lifelong friend of Hillegiest. The youth pinned the reward posters around the heights and attempted to reassure Hillegiest's parents that there may be an innocent explanation for the boys' absence. On August 17, 1971, Corland Brooks encountered a 17-year-old acquaintance of Brooks named Reuben Watson Haney walking home from a movie theater in Houston. Brooks persuaded Haney to attend a party at an address Coral had moved to on San Felipe Street the previous month. Participation of Elmer Wayne Henley In the winter of 1971, Brooks introduced Elmer Wayne Henley to Dean Coral. Henley was likely lured to Coral's address as an intended victim. However, Coral evidently decided the youth would make a good accomplice and offered him the same fee, $200, for any boy he could lure to his apartment, informing Henley that he was involved in a white slavery ring operating from Dallas. Henley later stated that, for several months, he completely ignored Coral's offer. However, in early 1972, he decided to accept the offer as he and his family were in dire financial circumstances. According to Henley, the first abduction he participated in occurred during the time Coral resided at 925 Schuler Street, an address Coral moved to in February 1972. David Brooks later claimed that Henley became involved in the abductions of the victims while Coral resided at the address he had occupied immediately prior to Schuler Street. If Henley's statement is to be believed, the victim was abducted from the Heights in February or early March 1972. In the statement Henley gave to police following his arrest, the youth stated that he and Coral picked up a boy at the corner of 11th and Studwood. The identity of this victim is not conclusively known. Although it is possible the youth was Willard Branch, a 17-year-old Oak Forest youth known to both Coral and Henley who disappeared on February 9, 1972, and whose emasculated body was found buried in the boat shed. A month later, on March 24, 1972, Henley, Brooks and Coral encountered an 18-year-old acquaintance of Henley's named Frank Aguirre leaving a restaurant on Yale Street where the youth worked. Henley called Aguari over to Coral's van and invited the youth to drink beer and smoke marijuana with the trio at Coral's apartment. Aguari agreed and followed the trio to Coral's home in his Rambler. Inside Coral's house, Aguari smoked marijuana with the trio before picking up a pair of handcuffs Coral had left on his table, whereupon Coral pounced upon the youth pushed him onto the table and cupped his hands behind his back. Henley later claimed that he had not known of Coral's true intentions towards Aguari when he had persuaded the youth to accompany him to Coral's home. In a 2010 interview, he claimed to have attempted to persuade Coral not to assault and kill Aguari once Coral and Brooks had bound and gagged the youth. However, Coral refused, informing Henley that he had raped tortured and killed the previous victim he had assisted in abducting, and that he intended to do the same with Aguare. Henley was again paid for luring the victim to Coral's home and subsequently assisted Coral and Brooks in Aguare's burial at High Island Beach.
despite the revelations that Corl was, in reality, killing the boys whom he and Brooks had assisted in abducting. Henley nonetheless became an active participant in the abductions and murders. Within one month, on April 20, 1972, he assisted Corl and Brooks in the abduction of another youth, a 17-year-old friend of his named Mark Scott. Scott was grabbed by force and fought furiously against attempts by Coral to secure him to the torture board, even attempting to stab his attackers with a knife. However, Scott saw Henley pointing a pistol toward him and, according to Brooks, Mark just gave up. Scott was tied to the torture board and suffered the same fate as Aguare. Rape, torture, strangulation and burial at High Island Beach. According to Brooks, Henley was especially sadistic in his participation in the murders committed at Schuler Street. Before Coral vacated the address on June 26, Henley assisted Coral and Brooks in the abduction and murder of a further two youths named Billy Walsh and Johnny DeLome. In Brooks' confession, he stated that both youths were tied to Coral's bed and, after their torture and rape, Henley manually strangled Balch, then shouted, Hey, Johnny, and shot DeLome in the forehead, with the bullet exiting through the youth's ear. DeLome then pleaded with Henley, Wayne, please don't, before he too was strangled. Both youths were buried at High Island Beach. During the time Coral resided at Schuler Street, the trio lured a 19-year-old named Billy Ridinger to the house. Reidinger was tied to the plywood board, tortured and abused by Coral. Brooks later claimed he persuaded Coral to allow Reidinger to be released, and the youth was allowed to leave the residence. On another occasion during the time Coral resided at Schuler Street, Henley knocked Brooks unconscious as he entered the house. Coral then tied Brooks to his bed and assaulted the youth repeatedly before releasing him. 31 Despite the assault, Brooks continued to assist Coral in the abductions of the victims. After vacating the Schuler residence, Coral moved to an apartment at Westcott Towers, where, in the summer of 1972, he is known to have killed a further two victims. The first of these victims, 17-year-old Stephen Sickman, was last seen leaving a party held in the Heights shortly before midnight on July 19. Youth named Roy Bunton was abducted while walking to his job as an assistant in a Houston shoe store. Bunton was shot twice in the head and was also buried in the boat shed. Neither youth was named by either Brooks or Henley as being a victim of Coral, and both youths were only identified as victims in 2011. Less than two months after the murder of Roy Bunton, on October 2, 1972, Henley and Brooks encountered two Heights youths named Wally J. Simino and Richard Embry. Henley later informed police he and Brooks had spotted the two youths as they walked towards Embry's home. Simino and Embry were enticed into Brooks' Corvette and driven to Coral's Westcott Towers apartment. That evening, Simino is known to have phoned his mother's home and to have shouted the word, Mama, into the receiver. On January 20, 1973, Coral moved to an address on Worth Road in the Spring Branch district of Houston. Within two weeks of moving into this address, he had killed a 17-year-old named Joseph Lyles. Lyles was known to both Coral and Brooks. He had lived on Antoine Drive, question mark, the same street upon which Brooks resided in 1973. On March 7, Coral vacated his Wirt Road apartment and moved into an address his father had vacated in Pasadena. 2020 Lamar Drive 2020 Lamar Drive No known victims were killed from February to June 3, 1973, although Coral is known to have suffered from a hydrocele in early 1973. In addition, around the time of Lyle's murder, Henley had temporarily moved away from Houston to Mount Pleasant in an apparent effort to distance himself from Coral. These facts may account for this sudden lull in killings. Lake Sam Rayburn, four victims killed by Coral and his accomplices in 1973 were buried at this location.
Nonetheless, from June, Coral's rate of killings increased dramatically, and both Henley and Brooks later testified to the increase in the level of brutality of the murders committed while Coral resided at Lamar Drive. Henley later compared the acceleration in the frequency of killings and the increase in the brutality exhibited by Coral towards his victims to being like a bloodlust, adding that he and Brooks would instinctively know when Coral was to announce that he needed to do a new boy, due to the fact that he would appear restless, smoking cigarettes and making reflex movements. After three days of abuse and torture, Lawrence was strangled before being buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Less than two weeks later, a 20-year-old named Raymond Blackburn was abducted, strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. On July 6, 1973, Wayne Henley began attending classes at the coach's driving school in Bel Air. In July 1973, David Brooks married his pregnant fiancée. He was strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. The other two victims in whose murder Brooks was not a participant, Charles Cobble and Marty Ray Jones, were abducted together on the afternoon of July 25th. Henley himself buried both youth's bodies in the boat shed. On August 3, 1973, Coral killed his last victim, a 13-year-old boy from South Houston named James Draymala. Draymala was abducted by Brooks and Coral while riding his bike in Pasadena and driven to Coral's home, where he was tied to Coral's torture board, raped, tortured and strangled with a cord before being buried in the boat shed. David Brooks later described Draymala as a small, blonde boy for whom he had bought a pizza and in whose company he had spent 45 minutes before the youth was attacked. August 8, 1973 On the evening of August 7, 1973, Henley, aged 17, invited a 19-year-old named Timothy Cordell Curley to attend a party at Coral's Pasadena house. Curley, who was intended to be Coral's next victim, accepted the offer. David Brooks was not present at the time. The two youths arrived at Coral's house, where they sniffed paint fumes and drank alcohol until midnight before leaving the house to purchase sandwiches. Henley invited Rhonda to spend the evening at Coral's home. Rhonda agreed and climbed into the back seat of Curly's Volkswagen. The trio then drove towards Coral's Pasadena residence at approximately 3 a.m. On the morning of August 8, 1973, Henley and Curly returned to Coral's home accompanied by Rhonda Williams. As Coral watched them intently, after approximately two hours, Henley, Curly, and Williams each passed out. The Shooting Henley awoke to find himself lying upon his stomach and Coral snapping handcuffs onto his wrists. Noting Henley had awoken, Coral removed the gag from his mouth. Henley protested in vain against Coral's actions, whereupon Coral reiterated that he was angry with Henley for bringing a girl to his house and that he was going to kill all three teenagers after he had assaulted and tortured Curly. He repeatedly kicked Williams in the chest. Henley calmed Coral, promising to participate in the torture and murder of both Williams and Curly if Coral released him. Coral agreed and untied Henley, then carried Curly and Williams into his bedroom and tied them to opposite sides of his torture board, Curly on his stomach, Williams on her back. Coral then handed Henley a hunting knife and ordered him to cut away Williams' clothes. Henley began cutting away Williams' clothes as Coral undressed and began to assault and torture Curly. Both Curly and Williams had awakened by this point. Curly began writhing and shouting as Williams, whose gag Henley had removed, lifted her head and asked Henley, Is this for real? To which Henley answered, Yes. Williams then asked Henley, Are you going to do anything about it? Quote, Henley then asked Coral whether he might take Rhonda into another room. Coral ignored him and Henley then grabbed Coral's pistol, shouting, You've gone far enough, Dean. Quote, Henley would later recall that, 
having shot Coral. The sole thought dominant in his mind in the moments immediately thereafter was that Coral would have been proud of the way he had reacted to the confrontation, adding that Coral had been training him to react fast and react greatly, and that was what he had done. After he shot Coral, Henley released Curly and Williams from the torture board, and all three teenagers dressed and discussed what actions they should take. Henley suggested to Curly and Williams that they should simply leave, to which Curly replied, No, we should call the police. Henley agreed and looked up the number for the Pasadena police in Coral's telephone directory. Contacting police At 8.24 a.m. on August 8, 1973, Henley placed a call to the Pasadena police. Minutes later, a Pasadena police car arrived at 2020 Lamar Drive. The three teenagers were sitting on the porch outside the house, and the officer noted the 22 caliber pistol on the driveway near the trio. Henley told the officer that he was the individual who had made the call and indicated that the body of Dean Corl was inside the house. After confiscating the pistol and placing Henley, Williams and Curly inside the patrol car, the officer entered the bungalow and discovered Coral's body inside the hallway. The officer returned to the car and read Henley his Miranda rights. In response, Henley shouted, I don't care who knows about it. I have to get it off my chest. Quote. Curly later told detectives that before the police officer had arrived at Lamar Drive, Henley had told him, I could have gotten $200 for you. Quote confession. In custody at the Pasadena Police Department, Henley was initially questioned in relation to the murder of Dean Coral. Henley recounted the events of the previous evening and that morning, explaining that he had shot Coral in self-defense. The statements given by Curly and Williams corroborated Henley's account, and the detective questioning Henley believed he had indeed acted in self-defense. When questioned regarding his claim that as Coral had threatened him that morning he had shouted that he had killed several boys, police were initially skeptical of Henley's claims, assuming the sole homicide of the case was that of Coral, which they had ascribed to being the result of drug-fueled fisticuffs that had turned deadly. Henley was quite insistent, however, and upon his recalling the names of three boys, Cobble, Hillegiast and Jones, whom he stated he and David Brooks had procured for Coral. The police accepted that there was something to his claims, as all three teenagers were listed as missing at Houston Police Headquarters. David Hillegiast had been reported missing in the summer of 1971. The other two boys had been missing for just two weeks. Moreover, the floor of the room where the three teenagers had been tied was covered in thick plastic sheeting. Police also found a plywood torture board measuring 8 by 3 feet with handcuffs in each corner. Also found at Coral's address were a large hunting knife, rolls of clear plastic of the same type used to cover the floor, a portable radio rigged to a pair of dry cells to give increased volume. Coral's 40 Econo line van parked in the driveway conveyed a similar impression. The rear windows of the van were sealed by opaque blue curtains. In the rear of the vehicle, police found a coil of rope, a swatch of beige rug covered in soil stains. Another wooden crate with air holes drilled in the sides was also found in Coral's backyard. Inside this crate were several strands of human hair. He, Henley, started to take a step inside the boat shed but then his face just turned ashen pale grim he staggered around outside the door right then's when i knew there were going to be bodies in that shed quote houston police officer describing henley's actions upon leading police to coral's boat shed on august 8th search for victims Henley agreed to accompany police to Coral's boat shed in southwest Houston, where he claimed the bodies of most of the victims could be found. Inside Coral's boat shed, police found a half-stripped car, which turned out to have been stolen from a used car lot in March, a child's bike, 
empty bags of lime, and a box full of teenage boys' clothing. Police began digging through the soft shell, crushed earth of the boat shed and soon uncovered the body of a young, blonde-haired teenage boy, lying on his side, encased in clear plastic and buried beneath a layer of lime. Police continued excavating through the earth of the shed, unearthing the remains of more victims in varying stages of decomposition, the ligature still wrapped tightly around their necks. All of the victims found had been sodomized and most victims found bore evidence of sexual torture. Pubic hairs had been plucked out, genitals had been chewed, objects had been inserted into their rectums, and glass rods had been shoved into their urethrae and smashed. Accompanied by his father, David Brooks presented himself at the Houston police station on the evening of August 8, 1973 and gave a statement denying any participation in the murders, but admitting to having known that Coral had raped and killed two youths in 1970. On the morning of August 9, 1973, Henley gave a full written statement detailing his and Brooks' involvement with Dean Coral in the abduction and murder of numerous youths. In this confession, Henley readily admitted to having personally killed approximately nine Police found nine additional bodies in the boat shed on August 9, 1973. Another victim unearthed had several fractured ribs. The 13th and 14th bodies unearthed bore identification cards naming the victims as Donald and Jerry Waldrop. David Brooks gave a full confession on the evening of August 9. He agreed to accompany police to High Island Beach to assist in the search for the bodies of the victims. On August 10, 1973, Henley again accompanied police to Lake Sam Rayburn, where two more bodies were found buried just 10 feet apart. As with the two bodies found the previous day, both victims had been tortured and severely beaten, particularly around the head. That afternoon, both Henley and Brooks accompanied police to High Island Beach, leading police to the shallow graves of two more victims. On August 13, 1973, both Henley and Brooks again accompanied the police to High Island Beach, where four more bodies were found, making a total of 27 known victims. Question mark, the worst killing spree in American history at the time. Henley initially insisted that there were two more bodies to be found inside the boat shed and also that the bodies of two more boys had been buried at High Island Beach in 1972. At the time, the killing spree was the worst case of serial murder. In terms of the number of victims, in the United States, exceeding the 25 murders attributed to Juan Corona, who had been arrested in California in 1971 for killing 25 men, the macabre record of number of known victims attributed to a single murder case set by the Houston Mass Murders was only surpassed in 1978 by John Wayne Gacy, who murdered 33 boys and young men and who admitted to being influenced by Coral and his accomplices. Families of Coral's victims were highly critical of the Houston Police Department. By April 1974, 21 of Coral's victims had been identified, with all but four of the youths having either lived in or had close connections to Houston Heights, lived in the Oak Forest District of Houston. Indictment On August 13, a grand jury convened in Harris County to hear evidence against Henley and Brooks. The first witnesses to testify were Rhonda Williams and Tim Curley who testified to the events of August 7 and 8 leading to the death of Dean Coral. The district attorney requested that Henley undergo a psychiatric examination to deduce whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. But his attorney, Charles Melder, opposed the decision, stating the move would violate Henley's constitutional rights. By the time the grand jury had completed its investigation, Henley had been indicted for six murders, and Brooks for four. Henley was not charged with the death of Dean Coral, which was ruled self-defense. Trial, conviction and incarceration
Elmer Wayne Henley and David Owen Brooks were tried separately for their roles in the murders. Henley was brought to trial in San Antonio on July 1, 1974. Other incriminating testimony came from police officers who read from Henley's written statements. In one part of his confession, Henley had described his luring of two of the victims for whose murder he had been brought to trial, Charles Cobble and Marty Jones, to Coral's Pasadena house. Henley had confessed that after their initial abuse and torture at Coral's home, Cobble and Jones each had one wrist and ankle bound to the same side of Coral's torture board. The youths were then forced by Coral to fight each other with the promise that the youth who beat the other to death would be allowed to live. After several hours of each youth beating the other, Jones was tied to a board and forced to watch Charles Cobble again be assaulted, tortured and shot to death before he himself was again raped, tortured and strangled with a Venetian blind cord. The two youths were killed on July 27, 1973, two days after they had been reported missing. Several victims' parents had to leave the courtroom to regain their composure as police and medical examiners described how their relatives were tortured and murdered. Throughout the trial, the state introduced 82 pieces of evidence, including Coral's torture board and one of the boxes used to transport the victims. Upon advice from his defense counsel, Henley did not take the stand to testify. His defense attorney, Will Gray, cross-examined several witnesses but did not call any witnesses or experts for the defense. On July 15, 1974, both counsels presented their closing arguments to the jury. The jury deliberated for 92 minutes before finding Henley guilty of all six murders for which he was tried. 34 Henley was sentenced to six consecutive 99-year terms, a total of 594 years for each of the murders for which he was charged. Henley appealed against his sentence and conviction, contending the jury in his initial trial had not been sequestered, that his attorney's objections to news media being present in the courtroom had been overruled and citing that his defense team's attempts to present evidence contending that the initial trial should not have been held in San Antonio had also been overruled by the judge. Henley's appeal was upheld and he was awarded a retrial in December 1978. Henley's retrial began on June 18, 1979. This second trial was held in Corpus Christi. David Brooks was brought to trial on February 27, 1975. David Brooks' trial lasted less than one week. The jury deliberated for just 90 minutes before they reached a verdict. He was found guilty of Lawrence's murder on March 4, 1975, and sentenced to life imprisonment. He showed no emotion as the sentence was passed, although his wife burst into tears. Brooks also appealed against his sentence, contending that the signed confessions used against him were taken without his being informed of his legal rights. But his appeal was dismissed in May 1979. Both Henley and Brooks are serving life sentences. Victims Corl and his accomplices are known to have killed a minimum of 28 teenagers and young men between September 1970 and August 1973, although it is suspected that the true number of victims may be 29 or more, as Corl had been killed immediately prior to his murders being discovered. The true number of victims he had claimed will never be known. To date, 27 of Coral's known victims have been identified, and the identity of a 28th victim whose body has never been found is conclusively known. All of these victims had been killed by either shooting, strangulation or a combination of both. 1970 September 25, Jeffrey Conan, 18 a student at the University of Texas at Austin abducted while hitchhiking from Austin to the Brazewood Place district of Houston. He was buried at High Island Beach. December 13, James Glass, 14, an acquaintance of Coral who also knew David Brooks, 
Glass was last seen by his brother in the company of Danny Yates walking towards the exit of the church the trio had attended. He was strangled with a cord and buried inside the boat shed. December 13. Danny Yates, 14, lured with his friend James Glass from a Heights Evangelical rally by David Brooks to Coral's Yorktown apartment. He and his friend were strangled before being buried in a common grave in Coral's boat shed. 1971 January 30th, Donald Waldrop, 15, vanished on his way to visit a friend to discuss forming a bowling league. According to Brooks, Donald's father, who was a builder, was working on the apartment next to Coral's at the time that Donald and his brother were murdered. January 30th, Jerry Waldrop, 13, the youngest of Coral's victims. He and his brother were strangled and buried in a common grave inside Coral's boat shed. March 9th, Randall Harvey, 15, disappeared on his way home from his job as a gas station attendant. He was shot in the head and buried in Coral's boat shed. Remains identified October 2008. May 29th, David Hillegiest. 13, one of Henley's earliest childhood friends. He was last seen alongside his friend Gregory Mallywinkle climbing into a white van. May 29, Gregory Mallywinkle, 16, a former employee of Coral Candy Company and boyfriend of Randall Harvey's sister. Winkle disappeared on his way to visit a local swimming pool. His body was found in the boat shed with the cord used to strangle him knotted around his neck. August 17, Reuben Watson Haney, 17, left his home to visit the cinema on the afternoon of August 17. Haney later called his mother to tell her he was spending the evening with Brooks. He was gagged, strangled and buried in Coral's boat shed. 1972 February 9, Willard Branch, Jr. 17. The son of a Houston police officer who subsequently died of a heart attack in the search for his son. Branch was emasculated before he was strangled and buried in the boat shed. Remains identified July 1985. March 24. Frank Aguirre, 18. Aguirre had been engaged to marry Rhonda Williams whose presence in Coral's house sparked the fatal confrontation between Henley and Coral. He was strangled and buried at High Island Beach. April 20th, Mark Scott, 17, a friend of both Henley and Brooks who was killed at Coral's Schuler Street address. According to Henley, Scott was strangled and buried at High Island, although his remains were never found. May 21st, Johnny DeLome, 16, a Heights youth who was last seen with his friend walking to a local store. He was shot in the head, then strangled by Henley. May 21st, Billy Balch Jr., 17, a former employee of Coral Candy Company. Balch was forced to write a letter to his parents claiming he and DeLome had found work in Madisonville before he was strangled by Henley and buried at High Island Beach. July 19th, Stephen Sickman, 17. Sickman was last seen leaving a party held in the Heights. He suffered several fractured ribs before he was strangled with a nylon cord and buried in the boat shed. Remains misidentified December 1993 and correctly identified March 2011. C. August 21. Roy Bunton, 19, disappeared on his way to work at a shoe store. He was shot twice in the head and buried in the boat shed. Remains misidentified October 1973 and correctly identified November 2011. October 2, Wally J. Simino, 14, lured with his friend into Brooks Corvette on the night of October 2. Simino attempted to call his mother at Coral's residence before the phone was disconnected. He was strangled and buried in Coral's boat shed. October 2, Richard Himbry, 13, last seen alongside his friend in a vehicle parked outside a Heights grocery store. He was shot in the mouth and strangled at Coral's Westcott Towers address. November 15, Richard Kepner, 19, 
vanished on his way to call his fiancée from a payphone. He was strangled and buried at High Island Beach. Remains identified September 1983. 1973 February 1st, Joseph Lyles, 17, an acquaintance of Coral who lived on the same street as Brooks. He was seen by Brooks to be grabbed by Coral at his Wirt Road address and was subsequently buried at Jefferson County Beach. Remains located August 1983 and identified November 2009. June 4, William Ray Lawrence, 15, a friend of Henley who phoned his father to ask if he could go fishing with some friends. Quote, he was kept alive by Coral for three days before he was strangled with a cord and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. June 15, Raymond Blackburn, 20, a married man from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who vanished while hitchhiking from the Heights to see his newborn child. He was strangled by Coral at his Lamar Drive residence and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. July 7, Homer Garcia, 15, met Henley while both youths were enrolled at a Bel Air driving school. He was shot in the head and chest and left to bleed to death in Coral's bathtub before he was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. July 12, John Sellers, 17, an Orange County youth killed two days before his 18th birthday. Sellers was killed by four gunshots to the chest and buried at High Island Beach. He was the only victim to be buried fully clothed. July 19, Michael Balch, 15, Coral had killed his older brother, Billy, the previous year. He was strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Remains identified September 2010. July 25, Marty Jones, 18, Jones was last seen along with his friend and roommate, Charles Cobble walking along 27th Street in the company of Henley. July 25th, Charles Carey Cobble, 17, a school friend of Henley whose wife was pregnant at the time of his murder. Cobble last phoned his father in a state of hysteria claiming he and Jones had been kidnapped by drug dealers. His body, shot twice in the head, was found in the boat shed. August 3rd, James Stanton Ray Mala, 13, the son of Seventh-day Adventists. Draymala was last seen riding his bike in South Houston. He last called his parents to tell them he was at a party across town. At Henley's trial in 1974, the Harris County Medical Examiner raised questions as to whether John Sellers was actually a victim of Dean Coral. Police had been led to Sellers' body on August 13th, 1973 by a tracker who recalled conversing with a youth he believed to be Henley after he had observed a car stuck in the sand close to where Sellers' body was subsequently found. The youth had rebuffed the tracker's offer of assisting to free the car, stating he had two friends with him who would free the vehicle. Neither Henley or Brooks specifically mentioned Sellers being a victim of Corals in their confessions nor have they disputed his being a victim. The official tally of victims was reduced to 26 in 1974 after Dr. Jack M. Chick testified Sellers probably was not murdered by Coral and his accomplices. However, Sellers was of the same age as Coral's known victims and his grave on High Island Beach was close to where confirmed victims of Coral were buried. In addition, the youth's body was found bound hand and foot with rope as other victims had been. Forensic Developments In June 2008, Dr. Sharon Derrick, a forensic anthropologist with the Medical Examiner's Office in Houston, released digital images of Coral's three still unidentified victims. The unidentified victims were listed as ML 73-3349. ML 73-3356 and ML 73-3378. Two of the unidentified victims were found buried in the boat shed and were estimated to have been killed in 1971 or 1972. On October 17, 2008, 
ML73-3349 was identified as Randall Lee Harvey, a Heights teenager who had been reported missing on March 11, 1971, question mark, two days after he had disappeared. Harvey, who had been shot through the eye, was wearing a navy blue jacket with red lining, Hanes and lace-up boots. A plastic orange pocket comb was also found alongside his body. A body found on a beach in Jefferson County in August 1983 is strongly believed to be a 28th victim of Dean Coral, which leaves a strong possibility that Coral had killed Lyles without the assistance of Henley. On September 13, 2010, DNA analysis was able to confirm that the unidentified victim known as ML73-3378 was actually Michael Anthony Balch, who had incorrectly been identified as case file ML73-3333. The second victim unearthed from the boat shed. Michael Balch had disappeared en route to a barber's on July 19, 1973 a year after his brother, Billy, had been murdered by Coral. The 1973 misidentification of Michael Balch was discovered as a result of an independent investigation conducted by a reporter named Barbara Gibson, who submitted her research to Dr. Derek that indicated that the second victim unearthed from the boat shed had been misidentified. Henley had stated in his confession to police that he and Coral had choked Michael Balch and buried him at Lake Sam Rayburn. The unidentified victim mistakenly identified as Michael Balch had been killed by two gunshots to the head and buried inside the boat shed. Three factors had helped lead to the 1973 misidentification of Michael Balch. Michael's parents had previously filed a missing persons report on their son who had previously left home to search for his older brother. In August 1972, question mark, precisely the same time as the second victim unearthed from the boat shed was estimated to have been killed. This was the only missing persons report on file from Michael Balch. In addition, the victim was of a similar height to Balch and circumstantial dental fractures had also helped facilitate the misidentification. On November 4, 2011, the victim mistakenly identified as Michael Balch. Case file ML73-3333 was identified through DNA analysis as Roy Eugene Bunton, a Heights teenager who was last seen by his family heading for work at a Houston shoe store in 1972. Bunton's family had always believed him to be a victim of Coral and had contacted Drive. Derek in 2009 to submit a DNA sample for comparison with the unidentified bodies. Initially, the results conducted had been negative due to the misidentification of Bunton's remains as being those of Michael Balch. However, upon discovering the 1973 misidentification of Balch's remains, DNA samples obtained from Bunton's family were compared to those taken from the body mistakenly identified as being that of Michael Balch and these proved to be a conclusive match to Roy Bunton. Bunton is estimated to have been killed on or about August 21, 1972. Mark Scott, initial DNA tests conducted in 1993 led to the remains of Stephen Sickman being misidentified as Scott. In the confession given by Elmer Wayne Henley on August 9, 1973, the youth had stated that victim Mark Scott had been strangled and buried at High Island. David Brooks had also stated in his confession that Scott, who was well known to both of Coral's accomplices, was likely buried at High Island. Scott had been a blonde youth who had not had any teeth extracted prior to his disappearance. However, a drive, Elizabeth Johnson of the Harris County Medical Institute had concluded in 1993 that the 15th set of remains unearthed from the boat shed, which had physical characteristics such as dark brown hair and two extracted molars, were those of Mark Scott. Dr. 
Johnson had based her findings upon comparison of DNA analysis of a blood sample taken from Scott's mother with the remains unearthed from the boat shed, stating with a 98.5% degree of accuracy the decedent had been related to Scott's mother. In a 2010 interview granted to an investigative reporter named Barbara Gibson, Henley disputed the 1993 identification of a victim buried in the boat shed as being Mark Scott, and reiterated his claim that Scott had been buried at High Island, in the sand, fetal position, head up, adding that he had repeatedly argued this point with Dr. Jackham Chick. As a result of Henley's claims, DNA tests on the body identified as Scott were again tested against samples of DNA taken from Scott's family. In March 2011, DNA analysis confirmed that the victim known as ML 73-3355 had also been misidentified in the same month. The victim was identified as Stephen Kent Sigman, a 17-year-old who was last seen walking down West 34th Street shortly before midnight on July 19, 1972 and who was murdered at Coral's Westcott Towers address. Sigmund's mother had reported her son missing shortly after his disappearance, but police had been unwilling to conduct a search for the youth, telling the mother that the youth was 17 years old and that unless they found a body, there was nothing they could do to assist her. Had Henley not been adamant in his assertion that the body of Mark Scott had been misidentified, Sigmund would have never been conclusively confirmed as a victim of Coral. All six bodies directly linked to the Houston mass murders found at High Island have been identified, as Henley's claim that the victim known as ML 73-3355 was not Mark Scott has been proven to be correct. A strong suspicion remains that the body of Mark Scott remains buried on High Island. Possible Additional Victims 42 boys had vanished within the Houston area since 1970, despite Henley's insistence that two further bodies had been buried on the beach in 1972. A curious feature about this final discovery was the presence of two extra bones, an arm bone and a pelvis, in the grave, indicating at least one additional victim awaiting discovery. The two bodies that Henley had insisted were still buried on the beach may have been those of Mark, Scott and Joseph Lyles. In light of developments relating to the identifications of victims, the body of Mark Scott still lies undiscovered at High Island and the victim Joseph Lyles was only found by chance in 1983, had the search for bodies continued. The two victims would have likely been discovered. Following Hurricane Ike in 2008, the area of High Island Beach where Coral is known to have buried his victims remains submerged, leaving a strong possibility the body of Mark Scott will never be found. How that man was able to go out to that storage shed, time after time, and bury one more dead boy is something I'll never understand. You get close to evil like that, no matter how long ago it was, and it never leaves you. Quote. Fellow workers at the Coral Candy Company recalled Coral doing a lot of digging in the years leading up to 1968, when his mother's third marriage was deteriorating and the firm was failing. Coral stated he was burying spoiled candy to avoid contamination by insects. He subsequently cemented over the floor. He was also observed digging in waste ground that was later converted into a car park. Former employees of the Coral Candy Company also recalled that Coral had rolls of clear plastic of precisely the same type used to bury his victims. Moreover, colleagues at the Houston Lighting and Power Company, where Coral had been employed since 1968, would also state that, from the earliest days of his employment, Coral had repeatedly retained coils of used nylon cord which would otherwise have been discarded. This brand of cord was the same type used to strangle and bind the bodies of many of his victims. Moreover, Brooks names Coral's first murder victim as a youth killed at an apartment complex on Judy Way Street, 
where Corl had lived prior to September 1970. It is possible that the initial double murder Brooks had discovered Corl in the process of committing occurred after the murder of Conan and before those of Glass and Yates. These details, alongside the fact two additional bones were found with the 26th and 27th victims discovered, indicate a minimum of two and possibly four more unknown victims. There are two suspiciously long gaps between known victims in the chronology of Coral's known murders. Coral's last known victim of 1971 was Reuben Watson Haney, who disappeared on August 17. The first victim of 1972 was Willard Carmen Branch, Jr., who disappeared on February 9, meaning no known victims were killed for almost six months. Moreover, Coral is also not known to have killed between February 1 and June 4, 1973. Coral's only known unidentified victim, the 16th body found in the boat shed, was in an advanced stage of decomposition at the time of his discovery, leading investigators to deduce that the victim had likely been killed in 1971 or 1972. This unidentified victim was found wearing swimming trunks. Regardless of the date when the unidentified victim buried in the boat shed had been killed, there still remains a gap of four months between February and June 1973 when no known victims had been claimed by Coral. In March 1973, a Mr. and Mrs. Abernathy, 3,670, two women had also observed three men digging at the beach in May 1973 one of whom they positively identified as David Brooks. However, police were again unwilling to extend the search. In February 2012, a picture was released to the news media of a likely unknown victim of Dean Coral. Potential association with Dallas Sex Ring During a routine investigation in March 1975, the Houston police discovered a cache of pornographic pictures and films depicting young boys. Of the 16 individuals depicted within the films and photos, 11 of the youths appeared to be among the 21 victims of Dean Corll who had been identified by this date. There is still no conclusive evidence to suggest that Corll had ever solicited any of his victims in this manner, not only because the Houston authorities chose not to pursue this potential possibility, but also because neither David Brooks nor Wayne Henley have ever mentioned meeting any individuals from the organization Corl had claimed he was involved with. In addition to these facts, they have never mentioned ever having seen the victims either filmed, photographed or released from Corl's torture board until after their torture and murder. The arrests in Santa Clara do, however, indicate a possible validity in two Brooks statements to police that Corl had informed him that his earliest murder victims had been buried in California. Media Film A film loosely inspired by the Houston mass murders, Freak Out, was released in 2003. The film was directed by Brad Jones who also starred as Dean Coral. This film largely focuses upon the last night of Dean Coral's life, prior to Henley shooting him and contacting authorities. Production of an as-yet-unreleased film directly based upon the Houston mass murders, in a madman's world, finished in 2014. The film is to be released on March 10, 2017. Television Factual TV host a documentary focusing upon the murders committed by Corl and his accomplices. Dr. Sharon Derrick is among those interviewed for the documentary. The Investigation Discovery Channel has broadcast a documentary focusing upon the Houston Mass murders within their documentary series, Most Evil. This documentary, entitled Manipulators, features an interview with Elmer Wayne Henley conducted by a former forensic psychologist named Chris Mohandy. 